Christ, the cornerstone. We're going to be talking, touching on uh, that concept in just a few moments. We're getting to our series, Family Matters. We're glad you're all here. Uh, we're talking about the family because the family is really essential. The family is not something that uh, is an optional uh, type of uh, arrangement or institution in our world. It's absolutely vital to each and every one of us. Uh, and the way that our family functions determines uh, to a great de degree uh, the direction of our life, uh, the way we were brought up and everything else, uh, as well as the way that I, we bring up our children. So as we continue to explore the dynamics of family from the perspective that God has given us, we see that uh, what we've been talking about up until this point is that families are about relationships. And um, as I think about this, I'm just so heartbroken at how many people just can't seem to get along in families. Uh, when you see the number of people that go through the most treacherous type of emotional um, travesty that they could ever experience, which is divorce, at such a, uh, an ex ex exp exponential pace, you just wonder to yourself, why is it that people can't seem to get along? And uh, of course, there's a lot of answers to that question of why we have divorce in such an uh, epidemic proportion. But um, it's really uh, a simple thing that we sometimes miss out on. There is a dynamic about learning to live together and learning to have unity. And there's a missing ingredient. And I want to read a verse for you. There's a verse in Psalm 127. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. So the psalmist begins this chapter just um, emphasizing the obvious. It's an absolute necessity that if we really want to have a healthy family the way that God designed then guess what? God needs to be at the center of it all. God can't be a peripheral um, person in the relationship. How can we have a godly home <laughs> without God? We've talked about the husband and the wife and the different roles they play, and we'll be discussing the children and uh, how to be good parents and all that in the, in the weeks ahead. But where does God fit in in this relationship? Because God's a person too. Uh, I often in marriage counseling show people a triangle. And I say, here's a triangle. And on one corner of the triangle, I write their name. And on the other side of the triangle, I write the name of the, uh, of the spouse or the people that are about to get married. And Mary's over here and John's over here. And I put on the top of the triangle, God. And I said, you know, this is a triune relationship. In Christian marriage, this isn't just about a husband and a wife. There is this dynamic element of having the supernatural God of the universe that binds it all together. And I then draw two arrows on the triangle going up. And I said, the more that Mary gets closer to God and the more that John gets closer to God, as they get closer to God, they'll become closer to each other. And uh, really, it's all about this, this triune relationship of, of man and woman and God all incorporated into this beautiful, fit relationship the way that God designed. And um, so, unfortunately, even though we have two people that can be in a relationship that are both Christians... They have no room for activities that are going to cultivate a Christ-centered home. So what would be a great thing to do to draw two people close, closer to Christ and to one another? It would be praying together. You look at the statistics on prayer in a home, it's just absolutely astounding. The family that prays together truly does stay together. You talk about Bible study and, and having time together to share in the Word so that you are sharing the things of God. That's true fellowship. 
I tell you, when you leave that whole dynamic out, you're leaving out this super glue in your relationship. And this is really what God really desires for us. God wants to be a part of our marriages. And unfortunately, many marriages, God is, again, something that is off, set on a shelf at the distance. Uh, but it's in paramount uh, it, for us to uh, see this and the importance of it. Um, it's sad, though, that the most important thing gets crowded out by the mundane. Uh, sometimes silly things, such unimportant things, replace the absolute essentials. Uh, there are some common misunderstandings and misconceptions that are being articulated about marriage in our society. And obviously, the first thing that we just talked about is this super glue that unites a man and woman together, and that's this, this relationship, their faith in Jesus Christ. When you have your faith in Jesus Christ, that's what unites you together as a husband and wife. If you can't share a faith together, then it's very hard to be united when this huge part, this huge element of your life is something you cannot share. So you definitely see why God talks about being, um, being uh, with someone that is of the same faith. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, the Bible talks about, right? Um, but there's another misconception uh, that is articulated in our society. Though we have lots of ideas that have been accepted by the mainstream, that doesn't make them true. It's always good to remind ourselves uh, that just because something has widespread acceptance doesn't mean it's right. And uh, so the majority is often wrong. And on this lie, I'll tell you, Satan is a master of lies, and he has brilliantly deceived men and women to believe some things about relationships that are just not true. And here's one of the lies that stands out, uh, I think, really high above them all. And here's the lie. Here's the lie that Satan says. Marriage is a 50-50 proposition. That sounds so wonderful, doesn't it? Marriage is a 50-50 proposition. Both people invest 50% in the relationship, right? And if you have two 50s, two times 50 makes 100, right? You get 100%. Uh, but that's really not a biblical concept. Like we talked about last week, if the element that is so important in a relationship is love, if our love is unconditional for one another, then our attitude should actually be that we give 100% even if we get zero in return. Uh, do you understand that what I'm saying here is, is that this give and take where, where she gives and I take, <laughs> or I take and she gives, uh, this isn't really God's design at all. This isn't, I'll invest in my marriage as long as she invests in the marriage. It's really not a, a, a contractual agreement. It's a covenantal relationship the way that God designed it. It's about a, a, it's about a commitment that you make that is absolute and unconditional. It's a mindset that says, I am 100% committed to you as my mate, regardless of your response to me. You could be a bum, and I'll still be committed to you. She could be a scoundrel, and I'm still committed to her. And of course, we know that that doesn't really happen. When we, when we love, love begets love. But we're, we're understanding that our attitude is that we love without condition. And Jesus made it clear. He said in Ephesians, we talked about this last week, that the husbands are to love their wives like what? Like Christ loved the church. Jesus didn't love us and say, well, listen, I'm going to meet you guys halfway. You come and you meet me right in the middle, right there. Jesus' love was not a 50-50 kind of love. Uh, he loved fully even when we had nothing to do with him. We didn't even care about him. It says why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us so much that he demonstrated his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus is demonstrating this unavoidable principle for the Christian 
and it has special application in marriage, and that is this concept of saying, and listen to this very carefully, denying ourselves for the other person. Jesus said it in Matthew. He said in Matthew 16, he said, Jesus said to his disciples, talking about a big principle here for following Jesus. He said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is not a burdensome obligation. This is not something that we do with our arm twisted behind our back. If we really are in love with Jesus, we have no problem denying ourselves for the sake of the cross. Jesus wasn't talking in riddles here. I mean, he was simply articulating a concept that does not come naturally for you and I. The natural man does not think this way. We are naturally selfish creatures. Did you know that? <laughs> At least for me, I know who I am in my natural man. So Paul is telling husbands in that passage we talked about, you need to set aside your rights for her. You need to die to yourself and willingly, not out of being forced to do it, willingly forfeit your rights and your desires because being one is most important. Being one with your wife is more important than anything else. It's more important than getting your way. It's not about uh, me losing myself. I still have my identity, but it's me saying that I care more about being one with this person than I do about being the person who always gets their way. Biblical marriage is actually quite radical, don't you think? Because it's not a 50-50 proposition. And that last concept I just talked about, that word, I want you to think about that word. That word is the key in marriage for the Christian, and that's the word oneness. It says that the two shall leave their mother and father, they shall cleave to one another, one another, and they shall become one flesh. Oneness is the concept that God is striving for in biblical marriage. Oneness is a beautiful picture of the kind of closeness that we should expect to have with God. Once we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we became one in Christ. We are now one we're no longer enmity. We're no longer his enemies. We're no longer separated. The wall has been torn down, and now we have oneness with God. That same picture is something that needs to be reflected in our marriages. There needs to be this oneness. So think about this picture. I want you to think about it in a literal way, okay? A literal wall. Are you building walls in your relationships, or are you tearing them down? And specifically in marriage. We're talking about family. And every relationship is either going to have, um, uh, to foster and cultivate oneness, or it's going to be a wedge that is divided between you. So are you building walls, or are you tearing them down? You know, I think there's a lot of things that you can do to build walls in your marriage. Some of the examples I could give you, I, I noticed that sometimes people have an inability to be transparent and honest with their mate. In fact, they're sometimes kind of secretive. They don't always want to share everything. Oh, I'm not going to tell my wife that I spent the money on the poker game because, you know, she'll be mad at me and of course, maybe there's a reason why you don't want to tell her, but it's regardless. Unless, of course, you won. Then you would tell her. <laughs> but, you know, these are things that don't tear down walls. They build up walls. Or insisting on having things your way. This is the way we're going to do it. And your, your insistence that this is the way we're going to do it, even though it might be very uh, hard for that person to accept, it doesn't matter stubbornness, unable to compromise, 
You can't compromise on anything. There's never a compromise. It's always got to be my way or the highway. Or there's another thing I, I see couples often do, and it's called the silent treatment, right? Someone doesn't like what the other person says, and then we just give the silent treatment to them. Or we just tune them out. Blah, 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 blah. It's like uh, the Peanuts cartoon. Blah, 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 blah. You don't even hear what they're saying. And that is a way to build a wall, isn't it? Um, I think sometimes what happens also, and I've seen this with couples, where they actually physically flee and stay away from one another, whether it's physically, sexually, or even physically just leaving and being away and always being busy so they never have time, because it does take time to tear down walls and build oneness and intimacy. And so it's easier just to stay away than to have to really work on this. And so those are all the kind of things that build walls. Um, there's another way to do it, and you can tear down the walls. But I want you to listen to this passage here. Uh, I think it's, it's in Galatians uh, chapter um, 5. It says, but I say, walk in the Spirit or walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. It's a very interesting passage. There is this battle going on. It's between the flesh and the spirit that is happening. And this battle is something that is exactly what is at stake in this issue of building walls and tearing them down. When the flesh is dominant in our life, when we're listening to the flesh and, and the desires of the flesh, we're going to put those desires above what the Spirit is saying, which is what? Love unconditionally. Deny yourself. Die to self. Be committed. Be gracious. You know, all those wonderful things. Um, but look what it says in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, it says, this is the, the Spirit speaking, right? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's a, a beautiful picture of what happens when we exhibit these type of characteristics. You have what? You have unity and you have peace. And it's true of any relationship, but especially in marriage. When you show humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance for one another, that, that engenders, that, that um, causes a blossoming of the relationship uh, to a new level of intimacy. It says in verse 4, there is one body... And one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is what happens when the Spirit of God is drawing us together and, he's, and we're walking by the Spirit, we're led by the Spirit, we're filled by the Spirit. Then you know what? Then what we're, what we're doing is we're cultivating oneness. You see, we could either build walls or we could tear them down. And so the opposite of building walls and tearing them is tearing them down. So think about the inverse of some of those examples. Instead of being secretive, when you show true authenticity, true vulnerability, transparency, honesty, when you listen, truly listen without interrupting, when you demonstrate that you truly understand what that other person is, is going through. When you show compassion, kindness, when you actually show empathy, yeah, yeah, maybe that person has a lot of struggles right now. But for you as a spouse or a mate, to be able to show true empathy, it, what does it do? It tears down the walls. It helps that relationship to become closer than ever. When you show patient acceptance, even when that person is imperfect. You know, it's really great. I love it. Uh, the, way that, the way that we do this to one another. 
And I say that sarcastically. Someone does something wrong in a relationship, in a marriage, and then we, because we didn't do that wrong, we have this response of self-righteousness. Well, I would never do that. And then the way that we act is we are self-righteous. That sinful mate of mine, that spouse, look what they did. Now, maybe they very well might have done something wrong, but there's no forgiveness in that picture. There's no patient acceptance and saying, hey, I love you anyway. It's, I'm superior to you. Oh, I'm sure that that kind of attitude is what's going to engender real oneness, right? No, it's going to, re, it's going to create resentment. Because now all of a sudden, you're kind of like feeling like you're second class, Joe. Because now I didn't measure up. And that person won't let you forget how you didn't measure up. And you know, our self-righteousness can actually push our mate away. So here we are. I didn't do anything wrong when my marriage crashed and burned. You didn't? How about the fact that you, you completely uh, pulverized you, the um, uh, esteem of your mate to the point that they felt it was hopeless and helpless and impossible to ever recover. See, our own self-righteousness can be a wedge to oneness. We've got to be really careful how we interact with one another. Remember, the highest goal above everything else in a marriage is what? I said it three times. Oneness. That's right. Good job. You're listening. You get an A plus, all right? So unless your mate is encouraging you to sin, I think that you should say, at all costs, I want to be one. That's what our goal should be. Marriage is a reflection of two people having a closeness that should be unlike any other human relationship that you'll ever have in life. There's an intimacy that you can have in a marriage that is so unbelievably fragrant and wonderful that God has designed. And, you know, not everybody, um, I mean, not everybody gets married. Not everybody, you know, and it doesn't mean that you can't have oneness with God and have a wonderful walk with God. But when God gives you that wonderful gift to have a relationship with someone in, in this wonderful relationship of marriage, it's something that um, is, it's unique to all other relationships you'll ever have. And um, so I don't know, is this, your, is this the primary goal, to be one with your wife and your husband? When the conflicts arise, we need to ask ourselves, do I want to be right or do I want to be one? You know, when you have a fight, you say, okay, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth it? Is what you're fighting about worth losing oneness in my marriage? I mean, in almost all cases we lose far more than we ever gain. And I think that we should guard our unity in our marriage. We should not allow anything to jeopardize the state of oneness that God has created. What God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. We should fight for it. We should not allow anything to sneak in and create a wedge in our relationship. So there's nothing that our mate could ever do that would stop us from loving them and hanging on because it's far too valuable. I don't know if, if we understand this, but when we demonstrate this kind of oneness, this kind of unity, this kind of love, it is the most beautiful picture to illustrate the love of God. That's what I think one of the great byproducts of marriage is. It brings glory to God because it's a reflection of Christ-like love. It's the same kind of love that Christ showed us. We already talked about that, right? This is a beautiful picture that we can display by the way we interact with our mate. Let me ask you, if someone looked at your marriage and you said to them, listen, if you become a Christian, God will love you like I love my wife. Would they say, well, then I want to become a Christian. 
Maybe they might say, <laughs> well, if that's the truth, then I don't want nothing to do with Jesus. You know, it should be, wow, if that's how much Christ loved me, then I want that Jesus. Because they can see how you treat your wife. They can see how you treat your husband. See, you see what a wonderful testimony, what a powerful um, illustration you can be to the world of the love of Christ. And really, it really is the most amazing thing. I never have gotten over the love of Christ. Have you? To think about what he did to save us. And um, I just think it's just a beautiful thing. You know, people have asked, you know, what's the primary difference between secular marriage and Christian marriage? And obviously the primary difference between a Christian marriage and a non-Christian marriage is what we said is that Christ is at the center. Uh, it's true that God should be at the center of our lives, whether we're married or single, but in a Christian marriage, a husband and a wife share this common aspiration together, and uh, that means their goals and their desires are focused on something eternal, not just the temporal. It's not just about, hey, how big of a house can we get, and how many kids can we have, and, and can, we get a, can we get a boat, and we go to buy a lake house, and it, it's like, no, it's, it's about things that are so much more, so much more valuable, right? The goal in marriage is to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to spur one another on to what? To Christ-likeness. That's what our goal is. I should, be, I should be striving every day to find ways that I can build my wife up. Uh, the purpose of this couple is to bring glory to God. And so if I can help my wife to grow spiritually, then we will bring glory to God. If she can help me to grow spiritually, we will bring glory to God in our life. Another distinct, like, I guess, characteristic of Christian marriage is that our relationship has a foundation that's very specific, and that's the Word of God. The Bible's our guide for how we live. In Christian marriage, the marriage is built on the principles that the Bible teaches. So when the Bible speaks about things like we talked about, like humility or selflessness, then that's how we're going to treat each other. When the Bible says this is the groundwork for the different roles of a husband and, and wife, of their responsibilities in a marriage, like we talked about the last couple of weeks, we don't have any problem following those guidelines. Why? Because the Bible's our authority. Whatever principles are given in the scriptures, these are the principles that we're going to follow in our home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, is what Joshua said, right? And when it comes to child rearing, this is the instruction manual for how we will raise our children. This is the instruction manual for what we will instruct our children about, is right here in God's Word. That's a distinctive. Another distinctive about Christian marriage is this personal um, development. Christian marriage is not to make us happy as much as it is to make us holy. We, we obviously will be happy. I've never been so happy in my life. I really mean that. I honestly think my, my wife has just been uh, just a, a breath of, the, of fresh air. It's just been just thrilling. But more important than whether I make her happy or she makes me happy, I hope that we're spurring each other on to be holy. And uh, so that's really important. Uh, we are um, in a relationship that is a tool that will help us to refine our faith. And believe me when I say this, <laughs> that marriage is a great place to learn how to live out what we believe. You have to actually live it out. When you're single, you don't have to worry about being selfish. If you want to sit in the bathroom for an hour, you could sit in the bathroom for an hour and read a book, but not if you're married. I got to get in there, honey. You know, all of a sudden, you can't be selfish, right? You have to learn what it means to be Christ-like. And uh, it really is a wonderful training ground 
marriage is a great place to learn to be like Jesus. So these are some things, you know. Um, I think we've done a, a very big disservice as I close today by focusing on the wrong things that are valuable in marriage. I believe that this whole thing about romance, oh, romance, oh, I got to find someone that I, I'm passionate about. Well, that's lovely, but passions are built on emotions, and passions rise and passions fall. But people who build their marriage on other values, like we've been talking about, those marriages are much more likely to stay together. Because when you build your marriage on this covenantal model of saying, I'm 100% committed to you, I'm 100% buying into this concept of being united in one with you at all cost, then it really doesn't matter about all of the, the, the um, ebbs and flows of your emotions. Because guess what? They go up and they go down. But my commitment to my wife will never change. My commitment to my wife is based on my covenant, the promise that I made to her when I stood right here. <laughs> I stood right here, and I told her, till death do us part. Now, she might have some ideas about getting rid of me one of these days, no. But seriously, it's a wonderful thing when you can find someone that wants to go through life with you, to share life with you, and uh, is there in good times and in bad, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, uh, for richer or for poorer, till death do us part. That, my friends, is a great thing. So, this is what we're striving for. And so once we've got the foundation, well, guess what? Now we've got the right apparatus. We've got the right environment to raise children that will be godly and effective members of society. I'll tell you, it starts with the marriage before it ever gets to the kids. So let's pray. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about kids next week. We're going to start talking about it. If you know anybody that wants to know more about how to raise kids, well, we're going to look and see what God tells us about how to raise our children. Father God, I just thank you. Marriage is a wonderful thing. I thank you, Lord, that you have graced us to be able to experience and enjoy that. And Lord, I also realize that there are some that are, have not had that opportunity. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would, again, display your love to them by showing how wonderful it is that you fill all of the, all of the gaps and that you can um, give them um, abundance and fullness, uh, whatever place they, they are at in their life. Uh, but, Lord, for those marriages out there, Lord, I lift them up to you. And I ask that Satan would not... Um, be able to drive a wedge into the marriages in this church. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see with your eyes that we would tear down the walls that um, inhibit oneness. I pray, Lord, that we would do it, whatever it takes to be um, truly united with our husband and in our wife. And I pray for that, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you that you've given us the greatest example of all by being our Savior, by coming to this earth, loving us so much. You loved us so much that you died for us. And you said that all we had to do was to receive you as our Savior, to believe in you, to trust in you that you paid for our, our debt, our sin debt, and we would have eternal life. Greater love has no man than this, than a man would die for someone else. And we, Lord, we thank you for your wonderful display of love. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who's never trusted in you as their Savior, right now, before we end this night, that maybe this would be the day where they say, Lord, I, I want to put my faith in you, the lover of my soul, the one who loved me so much that you... You gave up the riches of heaven to become a man and die in my place. Lord, I believe you died for me, 
and I'm trusting you as my Savior. And I pray that everyone here has this confidence that you are theirs uh, and that they are yours. And Lord, I pray for that in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah, if you've trusted in Christ, you are now one with Christ. And that's a great big amen. And so we're going to keep going on with this series. Uh, that, like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit about parenting. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some really good discussion after this. But I think Pastor Skyler Revis would like to close. You got a good song for us?